Okay, it looks like we've got a good crowd, 30 people. It's amazing for this time of year. Appreciate everybody's attendance this morning. Really, the inspiration for this call, this webinar, was uh, we did a webinar previously, and we drilled down into some fairly technical stuff. And there were some requests just to get back to the basics of BioCell. And, of course, people have a lot of questions. And this is a call for clarity. So we decided to call it BioCell for Dummies and cover off a lot of the basic questions that people have over time. We're going to keep it super simple today. We're going to try to keep it within an hour. And I believe I have the superstar of agronomy, Sulfur, Elston Solberg, joining me. He's not on the call yet. I'm sure he'll be with us shortly. In terms of our agenda today, we're going to talk about the macro picture, the 30,000-foot view, and try to keep you awake. Our agenda is why. Why would we apply bio cell? Why would we apply elemental sulfur? Why does it work? Why does it make sense for your farm? How, how do we make it? How do you get it on? How do you get it to your farm? How is it handled? When? When do we put it on? When does it release? When is the right time to get on the BioCell program? Where? Where do you put BioCell? Where do you get BioCell? Where's BioCell made? Who? Who's involved with BioCell? Who's applying BioCell? Who can apply BioCell? All that good stuff. So some really basic questions we're going to answer for you guys. Now I wanted to offer to you, you can simply text me if you have questions. My number is 204-573. 2069. And if you text me a question, I will do my best to get that into the webinar. But all of the participants are muted. We now have 36 people on the call. Uh, we've done a few of these. And uh, I work out of home, so I know how it is. But often there's a lot of background noise, and people get put on hold, and there's beeping, and crying babies and barking dogs and compressors going off. So we're just going to have a muted call. Now, I would say if you do have a question at the end and uh, you want to ask us something, you can hit star six. It's sort of a Q&A format. But let's get this rolling. So I always like to start with something fun. And I wanted to do a little sulfur trivia at the beginning. So I just have two really interesting points about sulfur. Sulfur is very fascinating when you look it up, of all things. What percent of the Earth's mass is made up of sulfur? We know sulfur is plentiful, but just how much of the Earth is made up of sulfur? And this, is, uh, this speaks to a question that people commonly have of biocell is, is there enough sulfur? Do we have enough material? And the answer to that is, almost 3%. That's enough to make two additional moons. That's massive. So there's plenty of sulfur to go around. There's no, there's no real limit to, to sulfur. And the other little bit of trivia that I have for you is, uh, what animal in nature uses sulfur as a natural defense? What animal in nature uses sulfur as a natural defense? And the answer is uh, sulfur compounds called mercaptans give skunks their defensive odor. Um, and it's kind of funny because this is also true of people to some degree um, because it's involved in our uh, intestinal processes. But uh, it's kind of a little interesting fact for you guys there today. So I actually forgot to introduce myself, if anybody's wondering. Um, my name is Dan Eberhardt, and our company is Eberhardt Ag Solutions. And we are the supplier, the distributor 
of Biocell in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And we represent Biocycle Solutions, the manufacturer. The product is Biocell Premium Plus. And we bring the product to the market through our network of trusted applicators in partnership with them. So let's start drilling down into the story of Biocycle. The story began really out in the feed lots of Alberta with the nutrient loading limit laws coming on. A fellow by the name of Neil Weens from Walker, Saskatchewan went out to Alberta to find fame and fortune as most people do. And he became that guy that took all kinds of material, turned it into compost, and tried to create value out of that. Composting is a really interesting process. It takes a number of different elements that have to be combined in certain quantities. And what happens, of course, is you have this microbial process that creates heat and bakes everything down to a humus-like substance that can be certified as a soil amendment to be applied to your garden, or in this case, your field. And it really offers some, some unique opportunity. And one of the interesting facts about, about compost that we've seen in the real world is at the Acme pad, where, uh, an individual, oh, sorry, the penhole pad, where an individual is farming out there. He's applying high rates of, of compost over time on his entire farm since he's got a compost pad there is experiencing low disease incidence. I think that speaks to soil health and, and biology in the soil and, and healthy plants, just like us, what you put into a plant speaks to their health. And also he's using very reduced rates of fertilizer. He's down to about 40 pounds of N at the max. So compost has a lot of value in the food production cycle. What BioCycle is doing that's incredibly unique, um, Neil had been taking away all kinds of material 10, 15 years. Everything from bio waste, which is human waste, bio solid, yard, yard waste, wood chips, drywall, there's massive amounts of drywall thrown out, straw, manure, can compost all kinds of things. But the catalyst for this product was when Neil took this pile of elemental sulfur and mixed it with the compost. And as we discussed previously, sulfur is incredibly plentiful on planet Earth and in the universe in general. There's millions and millions of tons of it that accumulate in large yellow piles, pyramid-like piles that are normally shipped around the world for, for mining and manufacturing. Sulfuric acid is one of the most common chemicals in all kinds of processes, and sulfur is used for all kinds of things. But this is the, the base stock for elemental sulfur products, including ours. And it's a byproduct of the oil and gas industry. It's scrubbed out of the refining process, and when you're creating millions of barrels of, of oil and gas a day, this stuff is incredibly plentiful and it piles up. And if it's burnt off, of course, it creates the gas that uh, people are concerned about. Um, so using it in the soils is far more effective than simply having it burn off. So that is a, a net plus for the whole cycle here as well. Elemental sulfur is, in fact, just like its name, an element. It occurs in the oil as a byproduct of the oil and gas industry. And this is what it looks like when it comes out of the oil field. This is very difficult to get onto your field. And that's why, in various cases, it's manufactured down to you know particles encased in bedmetic clay, in some cases, using bedmetic clay as a carrier. In the case of biosol, we are using compost as the carrier, all we're doing. Compost has 
it, it's, it's rich in nutrients, but we don't have enough volume to tell you that you're going to get an N, P, or K balance out of the compost here. Nor can we say that we're putting enough compost on to enhance your organic matter. Now we can say there's some interesting things going on with the biological activity in the soil by virtue of the compost. And we're working hard to identify what those are and what the net benefit to the soil to the producer will be. We know that in conjunction with elemental sulfur, the compost makes nutrient other nutrients more available, more efficient. And Elson has some research that he's going to share with us over time here that uh, that clearly demonstrates that. And I think that's fairly common knowledge that having a proper macro balance of sulfur in the soil really allows a lot of the other nutrients to become more efficient and more available in the soil. Now, these are some uh, kind of pictures from back in the day from the process, but really all that we're doing is we're taking raw sulfur and we're, we're blending it with compost. So, so in the first picture there, you can see some of the larger boulders of sulfur. This stuff comes out, it's, it's literally, you, you, you can't break it with a sledgehammer. It's like a rock. And when we apply, we, when we blend the compost, the finished compost, to the elemental sulfur, you can see the steam coming off that compost in the, in the second picture there. That is not, um, you know, that is not uh, simply temperature occurring. That is biological activity creating that temperature. So we know there's all kinds of bugs that go to work in there. And what, what you get is a more refined product with all different particle sizes that's baked down to something that makes agronomic sense and can physically be spread. Now, people have gone out to the, to the oil field and grabbed some elemental sulfur and spread it on their field, but the availability of, of a golf ball size particle, <laughs> if you want to call it that, sulfur is a long period of time, and we all know we're in this game for the long term, but some things are, are, are beyond uh, reasonable. So you want to get the particle size down to the range that we're working with. And the compost serves a couple of different purposes. It breaks the elemental sulfur down. It introduces an element of moisture so that we don't have the same risk of, of fire that we normally do. So this will this will burn, this product will burn, but it will burn slowly. And it, you don't get the same risk of explosion where you have dusting with the manufactured elemental sulfur inside an enclosed building. Because one of the other really interesting things about this product is that it's stored outside. So we're reducing the risk of fire, we're Reducing the dusting associated with elemental sulfur, one of the challenges with elemental sulfur is that if it gets into your eyes a couple hours later, it turns into sulfuric acid, and that is not fun. So you don't really know you have a problem if you're not using gloves, if you've got dust into your eyes, if it gets into your clothes, in your hair, and you go and shower that night until it starts converting to sulfuric acid, which is not good for eyeballs. And I know people who have worked with elemental sulfur have experienced this. And it's part of the reason that between the risk of fire and the handling of getting into your hair and eyes and clothes, part of the reason that producers have gone away from handling elemental sulfur at times. Whereas biosol has its quirks, there's no doubt, in terms of flowability and the handling and the unique equipment that you need. But overall, you will not experience the same level of fire of dusting by virtue of the, the compost. So the compost breaks down the elemental sulfur, reduces the dusting, reduces the risk of fire, and, and key agronomically introduces the biological activity, which we all know is extremely valuable in the soil. And many companies are scrambling to create that next level of value in terms of product that has microbial activity in it. 
So it's a beautiful cycle. I won't go into it too much, but we are collecting organics out of the back end of grocery stores in Calgary that would normally go to landfill. That's essentially perfectly good food. We're depackaging it at a facility at Calgary, and if you haven't seen this yet, go on to our YouTube at Eberhard Egg Solutions, and it will blow your mind. Or check out our website. It will blow your mind. And if you've ever physically visited it, it's, it's a visceral reaction. I mean, it's for real. BioCycle collected, and its group of companies collected, I believe, 30,000 metric tons of waste from the back end of grocery stores last year. And when you go in there, it's not a rotted scent. It's not rotted food necessarily. It's just we are this fortunate in North America to be able to throw out almost half of our food just at the retail level not to mention, you know, at the production level or at the consumption level, which is extraordinary. And you guys are part of the solution in having that food diverted from the landfill. And in Calgary, shortly, that's going to be mandated, that it's legal. That you cannot throw organics into the landfill, and this will be coming throughout society over time. So we are recycling those nutrients. Now, when it says organic fertilizer, we have to be careful there. We have organic certification coming. Unfortunately, currently, we're not organic, but we are definitely working to address that market. As I know, many organic producers are very interested in this option for, for their farming practices. So we're removing the organic goo. We're depackaging it. We're blending it with elemental sulfur, and we're using this to regrow crops. I just received a text message from Krista at the, uh, at the depackaging facility. Thank you, Krista. And she is stating that we, we collect about 70,000 kilograms a day right now. 70,000 kilograms a day right now. And so that's really cool because if you're working at the depackaging facility, you don't even really need to bring a lunch. I'm just kidding. Technically, they're not allowed to eat the food, but if they would, they could. And I've seen a few good hams and a vanilla cakes and various things in there that I wouldn't mind getting my hands on. <clears throat> what we have heard in the community a little bit is uh, when people are asked about what do you think about biocell, uh, we've, we've heard it said, why would you put garbage on your field. So the definition of garbage is wasted or spoiled food and other refuse as from a kitchen or household or a thing that is considered worthless or meaningless. But it's not garbage that we're spreading on fields even if we joke about it. It's compost, a certified for soil amendment compost by virtue of the Council, Compost Council of Canada you know, has to be, it's regulated to sell it on this scale. So the, it's compost that we're using. And compost is a decayed organic material used as the plant fertilizer. So it does make sense to put a plant fertilizer on your field. Doesn't necessarily make sense to put garbage on your field. Just want to do a time check. Elson, are you with us this morning? Okay. If Elson comes on, we've got an agronomic proportion for you, but if he's not going to be on, I will address that myself. So the question is, we've got this unique product. How do we skin this cat? How do you get it on? How do you use it? agronomically. Where do you get it? Well, agronomically speaking, the cool part about this product is the variable particle size. And it's what allows us to put a large amount on, keep a large supply of slow-release sulfur rocking and rolling in our soils, releasing to that soil profile. It doesn't leach until it becomes available. But our basic, basic, basic strategy here is 
keeping it simple sulfur, we're going to put on a ton of it. Well, not exactly a ton of it, but a tenth of a ton of it. A tenth of a met met metric ton of it per acre, to be exact, which I'll get into. And we're going to let it release slowly over time. So if you put a, a product like uh, ammonium sulfate on, which is all sulfate, it's immediately available. Yes, granted. And that's one of the myths about, I think, about elemental sulfur is that, you know, it's not available. Yeah, yeah, it takes time to break down, but if we put it in the right place and we put it at the right rate, we've had good luck on availability in basically all circumstances. So it's very simple. We have different particle sizes, as you can see here. So this is what's called the SGN scale. And different size particles will go through these different size mesh and show you roughly what the particle size looks like. Actually, this is a really good representation. So those smart, smaller, finer particles at the bottom are almost like dust. That's how fine they are. If everything from like one micron to less than one micron to much larger. And it's the smaller particles that are more immediately available and the larger particles that will take more time to break down. But they're all releasing in the soil to some degree as we roll. So how does elemental sulfur convert in the soil? Well, think on this for a second. We need good temperature, 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. We need adequate moisture. If, it's, if the soils are saturated, there's not going to be conversion. If it's too dry, there's not going to be the same rate of conversion. We need oxygen for the conversion. And we need this microbial activity. It's biobacillus is the superhero, as Elton would say, of the of the soil conversion of elemental sulfur to sulfate. But there's thousands of other species that do that work as well. And we are very interested in the effects of the microbes and the compost on this whole process, as it seems to make things quite available. As we've talked about in the previous webinar with third party data and from all of our research and, and real world results. And it's particle size that dictates the rate of release based on the surface area. So some of those smaller particles, we think about this as, as a bank, as you're making a deposit of sulfur to the soil bank. Some of that product, biosol, is going to be available as going to the teller and taking out some cash. It's there for all intents and purposes tomorrow. When my brother started applying uh, biosol on the farm at Langenberg in the spring of 2015, he did it after seeding, full seeding. Now, to be fair, he's had an aggressive fertility program on all fronts for a long period of time, but with the rates that we're using, the variable particle size, and biological activity, all that good stuff. We've got great availability immediately. Whether you apply for fall, or winter, or spring for that that season. And some of those larger particles are only going to be available long term. So even in our most aggressive math, well, who knows how large crops people are going to be growing in five to ten years. Even if we use hundred pounds of sulfur, we'd still have a third left over. We had 100 pounds of uptake in five years with the rates that we're putting on. You still have 50 pounds of slow-release sulfur working away in your soil. Well, that's, that's, this is a significant long-term program. So you put it on once, you've got two to three times the rates of sulfur that you normally put on. Most producers that I talk to that are using more sulfate are using 20, 25 pounds per canola crop in their rotation, which amounts to 50 to 75 pounds in a five-year period of actual. With the biosol program, we are putting on over 150 pounds of actual. So those larger particles, yeah, 
they do take longer to break down, but they're always releasing into the soil. There's only a certain percentage of them, and price point allows us to take this approach. They say good for, for multiple years. I think this is one of the challenges of the product for producers to, to sort of get comfortable with. So we know that the release is good up front, but how long will it last? And how can we be sure that it's doing what we want it to do long term and when would we need to apply again? It's almost a leap of faith more in the end than the beginning because we have to trust that it's going to be there long term. So let's break this down a little bit for the legal analysis of the product, which is 00070. There's not enough NPK in there to register on the legal analysis scale. And we can actually apply this product uh, throughout the winter as there's no NMP risk of, of leaching of any significance. And on that note, the 70% analysis is a is guarantee. And the analysis of the sulfur content has to be done by specific labs that have the ability to melt that sulfur down. And they have a little oven at the site constantly testing the batches. But what we have maintained is that uh, because it's a blended variable product, you are getting 70% actual S or more in general. And because it's a blended product, not a manufactured product, we can dial it into 70, so we have to overshoot. So in general, samples will read 75, 80, 85 percent in many cases. So you're actually getting more sulfur because of the blended variable nature of this product. If we get better manufacturing techniques, likely we'll be closer to 70. 220 pounds an acre gives you over 150 pounds of actual S or 10 acres per metric ton, which is pretty simple. And I could have written in here that we have uh, 40 metric tons per load. So that gives us about 400 acres per truck of product. If it's going direct to your farm, that's important to know. So you can work with those multiples. And we'll talk a little bit about how the product's delivered. And the question I had yesterday is, what is the density of this product? It's fairly dense, it's 60 to 70 pounds per cubic foot. And that's important to know when we're calibrating our spreaders and working with our equipment. So how do we know exactly when we need to apply again? How long this product's gonna last in the soil? Well, in the world of agronomy, nothing is certain, and of course, in the beginning when we were learning about this product, kept badgering my little brother Terry, who's, uh, who's quite an accomplished agronomist, exactly what the rate of release was and how he would be more certain exactly when to re reapply and so forth. And often the comeback was that it's agronomy and nothing is, is certain <laughs> for 100% for because of the complex nature of these natural systems. But the reality is that we can do a couple things. We can keep an eye on our uptake rates based on our yields that are known. So we can do napkin math and say I've grown these crops and in general these crops use this much sulfur and this is what I would have taken out and I need to put that back in to keep building to be sustainable. We can also Tissue test is likely the most the most effective way to measure what's going on in the soil with sulfur in our plants. Soil samples are highly variable. And they're not necessarily a good indicator of your sulfur sulfur levels in the soil because sulfur is mobile in the soil. 
once it becomes converted to sulfate. It's not necessarily mobile as elemental sulfur. That's the beauty if you have it on sandy soils, on a hill, it's a great place to pour on the biosol, especially if you're thinking variable rating, because you'll find sulfur in the low spot and sulfur deficiencies on the hills where the nutrient can move through the soil. But you'll have, you could have one spot that's really, really high in sulfur, and you could have one spot that's really, really low in sulfur. And that's not necessarily indicative of the scope of what's going on with sulfur in the soil, and it can skew your results. So in general, don't recommend that you go by your soil test, but rather use a tissue test to see what's going on in your plan. And if there was to be a sulfur deficiency, it can be corrected in time to avoid yield loss. But I think Elston, if you were here, would would definitely say that overall there's a lot more sulfur deficiency that's going on and a lot less sulfur put on than should be in general to help us reach our fertilizer goals and getting our macros in line is one of the easiest things that we can do to be foundational for our yield goals. This chart was prepared by uh, Glenn Helgeson who is the original trusted applicator original guy who came to us when we first started out in July of 2015, saw the potential of this business. He's on the call today, I believe. Hello, Glenn. Thank you for uh, sharing this with us. So if you take a look at average yields of different crops like canola, wheat, winter wheat, barley, et cetera, et cetera, and average yields, and you look at sulfur uptake, it's just a reminder that all crops use sulfur. And if we look at the five-year rotation of these different crops, canola, wheat, peas, canola, flax, and of course it's going to differ by where you are and what yields you're growing. But the average sulfur uptake in this case is 90 pounds. And 90 pounds logistically and financially is very challenging to get on with 210024. In our program, we're putting on over 150 pounds. So that's where that top there is likely going to carry over and be available for, for future uses. Here's another chart that indicates the different crop usages. And the interesting thing looking at this this morning is flax actually uses more pounds per bushel of sulfur than canola. I think it's interesting that lentils use 0.3 pounds per bushel. Um, alfalfa grass absolutely love sulfur and since Elson's not on this call that I'm aware of I'm going to steal a little bit of its thunder and I am going to grab his slide here oops that's the right one I wanted I'm going to grab Elson's slide here to show you quickly what Biosol looks like on sulfur deficient hayland. So there's your check strip, there's your NPK, and there's your biosol. That's after 19 days on sulfur deficient hayland. And there was a huge increase in yield. And a lot of that is making the other nutrients that are in the soil more effective. So a lot of people might expect, oh, what am I going to see? Like your first year, is your canola going to be that much better? Well, if you're putting sulfur down with your canola and you're putting enough down, you might not see a huge bump on your canola. Not if you're sulfur deficient yet, of course. But I think the real exciting part is that agronomically, elemental sulfur is superior in the way that it does not leach in the same way as ammonium sulfate. It's a low salt index versus a high salt index, which is extremely critical in lots of geographies. It's slow acidity versus quick acidity. And it's a way of being able to afford to logistically and financially get enough sulfur on for all of your crops or all of your rotation. 
in a way that you simply physically can't, especially as you guys continue to grow bigger and bigger and bigger crops. So when people ask about data, there's three kinds of data that exist for biosol. One is the anecdotal data that we've got with the hundreds of thousands of acres of top producers that have applied it across all of Western Canada. Last year in Western Canada, we probably had about a quarter million, quarter million acres go down um, last year's crop. This year's crop, between all of us in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta, we're likely going to have 600,000 acres down of the product and not a lot of bridging strategies. Um, in, some case, in some cases, we do have alternate sources of fertilizer that have gone down for various reasons, but most people are not using a bridge strategy. And if you're thinking you need a bridge strategy or you want that level of comfort, of course, you can put some ammonium sulfate down with the blend. Or you can put more biosol on. So we have anecdotal data, the, the, the producers that are using this and seeing good results and, and being comfortable with the process. We have another level of data, it's tissue tests. And Matt Gosling was one of the first people that started spreading this product in Alberta in 2013. He's done hundreds of thousands of acres. He's the top agronomist in his, in his business and he's got a lot of science, a couple, I think he's got about 150,000 acres or so under consultation, people that pay him for his advice, and uh, he's had really good luck with elemental sulfur in general, starting out with the manufactured elemental sulfur in 2007, and then going to a, uh, going to a biosol in 2013. So he's got all kinds of data that uh, we've got on file. He, he can go into his exit data system, throw a dart into there, pick almost any of his producers, and almost all of them are using biosol, and their end to S ratios are good. And the trend lines are powerful. They're, they're, he's getting uh, great sulfur release, even through massive crops that grow out there in Strathmore, wheat canola, wheat canola, big bushels, on to number two. And what some of the math they're doing is exactly what I was talking about, how if you're growing 60 bushels of canola, you're taking out 30 pounds, then you've got 125 pounds left available. You keep deducting that, you'll have that top third left over. So we have a lot of um, agronomists in our network, and we have a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of data that can be provided through our, our tissue tests and whatnot through, through our agronomist level. And the other level of data that we have that I encourage you guys to go and watch is a previous webinar that we did of third-party data that Nelson and I um, had a webinar on. It was extremely powerful. And that's a whole different webinar, so I'm not going to go into that today. But that is the, the three different kinds of data that we have. Um, what, what producers have experienced, um, what our agronomists in the network have experienced with their producers, and some of the third-party data that exists and we've talked about that's on YouTube or on our webinar. I think it was our Keep It Simple Sulfur webinar it was our first one. And yeah, like I said at the beginning, that one was quite technical, so that's why we're trying to keep this one simple. And there's another method of, of testing your, your sulfur levels in the soil, and it's the Western Ag PRS analysis. Um, so I wanted to give them a shout out too. That's an interesting process, and you guys should check that out as a tool to fill up your bin in your businesses. So just to backtrack a little bit about, the, talk about the handling of it, we got started with this product in Langenberg, Saskatchewan, GX94 country, God bless them, in uh, the spring of 2015. And my brother was one of the first guys to use it, and of course, you know, guys in his network were talking about this magical sulfur product that uh, was pretty cool back in the day. And um, finally, he's, you know, got the means to bring it into Saskatchewan. And <laughs> this is this is uh, Harvey, who's a partner in our business, Aberhart Egg Solutions, and probably one of the hardest working men I know, who uh, loves to get in there and uh, get things done with the JCB, scooping the stuff off the ground from a pile, from a central location, doing their canola acres, uh, 3,000 acres or something they did in the spring of 2015. And so that was a pretty big, 
pretty, pretty, pretty big learning curve. Um, but it worked quite well. And when we look at the logistics of this product, it's a mind band. It's, it's, it's hard to get your head around, but you've got to think about Lyme around the world. This is actually, um, our, our network is moving towards tendering and handling this for producers commercially so it never hits the customer's field. Because the product has low pH, like in that spot you see where the, where the JCB is, nothing will really grow there potentially. Now it depends how, you know, on the buffering capacity of your soils and the pH, if you have high pH of your soils, and your soils are tight, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, we want people to understand that where you put a pile, um, you should put it on a spot in an old yard or you should put it on a saline spot, which is a whole other story. It actually, elemental sulfur in some cases can treat stolen acid soils and saline soils, but beyond the scope of today's webinar. But it stores on the ground quite nicely. You don't have to worry about it going rock hard in your bins. I was just at a producer's place yesterday where he bought some some uh, wrecked ammonium sulfate that they had to use like a big, big uh, smashing toe on the excavator to break it apart because humidity got into it and it was absolutely ruined. So we don't have those problems. I mean, it can literally be out in the elements and the moisture level can be somewhat variable, but again, we're compensating for that with, with the blend of sulfur. So in terms of efficiency, um, it's kind of an advantage where we don't need bins. You don't need to buy bins. You don't need to fight to get it out of bins. You don't need to worry about it going bad. Uh, it stores relatively cheaply. Um, but it's not handled through your traditional equipment there. You see super bees and you see bins there. Um, all of you have invested in that, and it's great if you can make use of it. But what if you could use that space for other things and use your sulfur, essentially store it outside? So this is my father, and we're, I guess we're Volga Germans uh, in terms of our ancestry and uh, somewhat stubborn at times. And so we had to find out, does it actually flow or not flow through a Super B? And what we found is we opened up the, we opened up the hopper at the bottom after a 10-hour ride from Strathmore, and, and a little came out, but really <laughs> there's just a hole, just a hole in the center and then you have to proceed to poke it through. So if you had people that were willing to, to poke it through for you know, four hours at a time, this, this would actually be uh, viable. But it does not flow through uh, boom floaters. It does not flow through augers. It does not flow through um, regular super bees. It does not go into bins. And it will not go through air seeder. So the way that we're handling it is with telehandlers, with Super B side dumps with end dumps, um, conveyors. And this is a photo back in the day uh, from Premium Ag when they were using product right off the ground. So they have a central pile and they load the spreaders from there. Now they have gone to quite extensive tendering system, which uh, our network is going to evolve to overall. So this is a new the Trout River live bottom going into conveyor, going into dry boxes, which is quite efficient. Another way to do it too is just have the pile on the ground and use a skid steer or loader. We were out at Hobbit Farms this last week. I believe uh, Gerald's on the call. Hello, Gerald. Um, and they just used their 73, whatever it was, 73, I can't remember the number of the tractor. I should, I'm a John Deere guy. Um, their 73XX. John Deere loader tractor to go into the conveyor to get into the dry box. And that worked really well. And, and some of the guys in the network are now going to rock conveyors that will handle entire end dumps at one time. That is how our network is evolving in terms of the logistics. This is us doing a lot of pan testing over time. And we started out at 48 feet. We are now spreading this product extremely accurately at 60 to 80 feet. And come to any demo any given day, and we can show you that. And it's quite compelling that 
you could take such a variable product and put it on. And just like that ammonium sulfate yesterday that I saw, that was, was a ruined product, because that producer was able to spread that with the spin spreader, he was able to buy that ammonium sulfate at a significant discount. So that's the one of the cool things I like about spin spreaders is you can always find some different opportunities to spread some crazy stuff once you got one. And it's extremely accurate. If you look at it even versus a air seeder or boom floater, from what I've seen, all the testing that we've done, the spin spreaders will stand up to any accuracy test. And they're used all around the world. So what we do is we set out pans at six feet, kitty litter pans. And we do an initial pass across the center, find out where overlap is. And then we do a three pass. And we'll adjust the position of the fan frame according to any discrepancies in what we want to achieve with our pattern. If we're heavy behind the vehicle, then we move the spinner and we you know, change the spinner speed. Um, if it's light behind the vehicle, you know, increase your spinner RPM or move the spinner rearward. So it's not that hard. And once you get it dialed in, you want to write that down, keep that as a little Bible and move forward. But we've, we've done time testing all over with all kinds of different machines. I'd say right now in the spreading community, it's uh, AgriSpread and New Leader and BBI that are leading the pack in terms of technology, and they all build great boxes. And like all machinery, they have their pros and cons, but we've had a lot of manufacturers get involved and really look at BioSol as a way to promote their spreading efforts. One of the big components of getting this product on accurately is, accurately, excuse me, is, the, is the weight. And because the product is variable, We've now got most of our guys using scales. And if you're not using scales, it's very painful because you literally have to calibrate by going out and catching it um, with a bucket. So I believe everybody in our professional network is using that um, and most of the producers that are spreading themselves. It's very simple. It's very, very simple. You go out and you spread 2,200 pounds on 10 acres by virtue of your scale on your spreader. And if it doesn't show that on the monitor, then you adjust your monitor accordingly. And you dial that stuff in by the load. So it's cool that spreading's coming back. It's extremely efficient. There's not much in iron that you can buy for 150000 bucks that's going to change the way you farm. And there's a lot of advantages. You've got a really wide window of application. And a lot of our application occurs you know, after harvest and over the winter. And there's you know temperature limits to when we can spread the product, of course. But the spreaders are starting up again now this spring, and we're going to go till right till probably fungicide season. And for a lot of producers, and I know my brother's big on this, is amortization of equipment and men. You already have the people in place. You already have a lot of this equipment, and you want to get every dollar you can out of your investments, given what things cost these days. So spreading allows you to get more of your, your men and your machines. And we talked about accuracy. These spin spreaders are incredibly accurate. And I think over time you guys are going to have more opportunity in your communities as this thing grows to get out and see physically see this. I know we're in, uh, I think we're somewhere around North Battleford on Tuesday. And a lot of the equipment dealers and uh, spreader manufacturers are really getting in on the action. but. Incredibly accurate, and volume. You want to get volume on, you open up the gate. And you guys are going to need to open up the gate because of the size of crops you're going to be growing with all the technology out there, with all the genetics. It's going to be something you, you need to do. And you've got less moving parts, less capital costs. You can get into a dry box for 150000 bucks and put it behind your existing tractor. Or you can get into a dedicated chassis, probably starting from you know 60000 bucks and up. You can buy the new John Deere for 450 But the fact is when new seeding equipment as a whole is $2 million, bucks, well, close to $2 million, bucks, thicker price. And you want to go from 80 acres of fill to 400 just feed and thaw. I know guys that are going to be spreading some thaw on top. It's just sort of maybe agronomic sacrilege to some, but 
I'm not going to fight that war today. But <clears throat> we are selling simplicity. Everything that you do on the farm can be a challenge in terms of implementation and complication. But this is one option that offers simplicity. And we have producers like Glenn Helgerson say, that's the first thing they've done in a decade or two that have made things a lot more simple. And when you go out there and you're spreading, or when you're seeding just, just your seed and your foss, which goes really nice, <laughs> seeding goes quick, and you don't have to get out except for pea breaks. We are bringing this product to the market through our partners in the business, our trusted applicators, our dealers. It's a network of commercial applicators that are certified. And they have safety standards. They have calibration and equipment standards. And they have professional standards of people that we've partnered with because we believe in their businesses and who they are to represent bringing the product to market. And uh, we're very proud of the people that have come on board. That's been a huge part of the success. It's large producers who get it and love it and want to be a part of it. It's agronomists who love it and get it and want to be a part of it. And we've got some retailers in the network that love it and get it and want to be a part of it. And this is roughly what our map looks like today. Um, these people can all help you get product, get it on, commercially tender and apply it. And when people say, well, there's a logistics problem to this product, I would suggest it's a huge opportunity where you provide your legals, you write the check, you go on with other things in your day, and these, these excellent professional companies will provide a professional service to get this applied, and you won't be dealing with sulfur for, for sure four to six years, uh, maybe uh, longer if you continue to apply elemental sulfur in your program. So I just wanted to play this funny little video. This is probably how we all felt last fall. We're going to wrap this thing up. Um, last fall went on and on and on. I know the statistics from the farm were something like um, 90 days or something of harvest. So it was extreme challenge. And one of the things that uh, is going to be a challenge this spring, too, is getting enough product on, and we think that we can help producers with, with the spring application of sulfur. That's actually an edited down version. It actually took them longer to fall down the hill. But this spring, if you're thinking about biosol, um, the pricing is on our website. It's general price. Our price moves incrementally, uh, you know, seasonally. But if you look at biosol, even around 300 bucks a ton, um, we're going to be half the price of ammonium sulfate and uh, a third to a quarter of the price per pound sulfur versus some other products. So financially, um, we can walk you through that. Um, it's a long-term investment in fertility, but cannot be beaten by the pound. And uh, it, it offers... Because of the financial price point, it offers a way for you to get more sulfur on than you've dreamed. Previously, we have FCC available for you guys as well. And if you're interested, speak to us about our exclusive to Aberhart Ag. Um, we, we, we have an interest-free program where we're paying the interest. It has nothing to do with FCC. Um, but we have an interest-free program as well. So we do have uh, financing available for you guys. I see that I have uh, talked now uh, to 8, uh, 8.59 my time, 7.59 your, your guys' time. And I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I think I'm going to call that the end of the show. And um, I'll maybe give, give some people a few minutes if they have any questions. But I would say that um, we had, we had uh, some questions checks, but I think I think we're good. Yeah, basically, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, here's my email. There's our website. 
Uh, if you give me a call, we can hook you up with a trusted applicator in your area. Uh, we, we retail through our trusted applicators. Appreciate everybody's time. Check out our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, our YouTube, our website. And have a safe and uh, productive spring out there, you guys, as we get into the season. Thanks so much for, for joining us. We had, I think, at one point we had about 45 people on the call. And uh, we really appreciate you guys taking some time out of your busy spring schedule and for, for your business. So I think, I think we'll just wrap it up at this point. And um, if you have any questions, just, just email me or contact uh, one of our trusted applicators there through our website. Thank you, guys, and uh, have a great day.